Thank you for having me. Fencing Bear is very happy to be here too. She's a, she is always willing to tell her stories and always willing to upstage me. So <laughs> if you would like to hear more about Milo or my adventures um, as Fencing Bear, I'm happy to talk about it, but we need to do some scholarship first. So we are losing our civilization, with what it means to be civilized to live in cities in the manner of citizens, to have families and children, to educate them, to have skills for speaking, writing, and making things. We have an assumption, we tend to assume, because we're surrounded by so much civilization that all of these things just happened, that they're just there for us, um, because we're born into a world that is already sort of the story's ongoing, right? And we're born into it and all of this stuff surrounds us, the institutions, the, the buildings, the manners, the educational practices, and it's very easy to simply assume that it exists, right? That it just is there. Well, it, it's not. It was invented and created over thousands of years um, and in the, European, in, in the European tradition over a very significant thousand years since around, well, I mean, before Charlemagne, Charlemagne can count. But how you count it, it's very interesting that we have become so anxious about telling the story as it begins in the Dark Ages or as it begins in the Middle Ages. And uh, why that happens um, is, is one of the great mysteries of our own civilization, why the civilization itself has turned on itself. And, and over the course of several hundred years, beginning around 1517, John and I had words about <laughs> the Reformation is a good thing, right? Um, beginning around 1517, there's been a, a, a critique within the tradition that says these centuries before 1517 were benighted, lost, um, repressive, tyr tyrannical, papal, and so forth. Um, what's interesting about studying the Middle Ages is that you're always having to counter that argument layered on top of a number of others, right? You're also having to deal with the, the arguments that come out of the 17th century with the English Civil War and the way in which um, the, the, um, the parliamentarians made arguments against the Anglicans. We're having to deal with the arguments that are made in the 18th century by the enlightened philosophes, people like Voltaire, who thought all, you know, our religion, Christianity, was the most you know, brutal and ugly thing ever invented and we'd, we'd be doing better just to get rid of it. We're having to argue against the 19th century, people like Mark Twain, who in his Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court makes a, a joke of, you know, the Yankee goes back in time and he finds all of these people living in Arthurian England and they're all oppressed by the Roman Catholic Church that's invented slavery. Now, d d <laughs> the layers of inaccuracy there are take, you know, take, will take an entire lecture to unpack. We are dealing with the, the 20th century and its reconfiguration of what happened in the Middle Ages. And so over and over and over again, you're always encountering, well, what I um, have described as lies, because they are lies. They're lies about the way in which a very complicated civilization developed over centuries and, curiously enough, developed the capacity to critique itself so well that we end up not even knowing where the civilization came from. You wonder why I'm called a Nazi or white supremacist. <laughs> I basically think we're not telling the full story and then if we need to do it properly, if we're going to do it properly, we have to go back um, to the Middle Ages. It's true that, and, and th this is what's interesting, some of the kinds of critiques that people bring to studying the civilization we're in, it's true that civilization creates um, constraints, right? Freud in his, in his civilization is discontent, su you know, suggested that these constraints are, um, well, they're, they're the thing that enable us to create art, but there's also this sense that they repress us, right? Freud in his, in his concern about sexuality is always um, wanting to say, well, it, it's, it's, if it's repressed, in Freudian terms, it realizes itself in culture. But of course, since Freud, the, the, subsequently that's turned into, you shouldn't repress yourself sexually, you should just let yourself be whatever you are. And that's, it, it is indeed actually opposite of what he said. Um, but the problem is, it, it's true that there are ways in which we learn to live in this complicated thing we call culture, and that they do, con they do constrain you. Manners, virtue, um, the sorts of things that enable you to behave well, have families, not scream at each other when you get in fights with your spouse. Those sorts of things are actually significant cultural achievements. And w one of the things that I am 
extremely concerned with in my own scholarship is how do we learn once again to talk about virtue? How do we learn once again how to train ourselves in the virtues that you know, developed over the course of the Middle Ages and have made our civilization possible? So when, I, when fencing bear started, she was um, a blog about learning defense, right? And a blog about prayer, which is therefore the, the title, right? Fencing bear at prayer. Um, and it was also, a, it very rapidly became a blog about learning how to train myself in schooling my emotions and schooling myself in um, recognizing falling into the seven deadly sins, right? And you, you end up on the, on the, you know, in the, in the, uh, fencing tournament, seeing someone else winning whom you wanted, you thought you could beat, man, envy, <laughs> it's right up there. And over the years that I was working on Fencing Bear, I realized I, I worked through a sort of schedule of the seven deadly sins to the point where when I made the post that probably you all have heard about with the three cheers for white men, I was, I, it was in effect saying, I've, I've trained myself to be able to cope with all of this interior, um, discipline. Now let's look at how it affects the rest of the culture, right? And my cheers were, of course, chivalry because men and women should behave well together, and there there are obligations that chivalry creates for both men and women. Um, consensual marriage because it matters that in the Western tradition, particularly in the Christian tradition, there's an expectation that both men and women have to say "I do" in order for there to be a marriage and then women's political participation, the right to vote. Those are my three cheers, and those are the things that got called me names um, by my colleagues in academia, so we can contemplate <laughs> exactly why that, that happened and why that was the case. So here I am today um, talking to you, hopefully, about some of the things that we need to consider in understanding where this civilization came from, how it developed in its complexity long before 1517, long before the 16th century and its self-definition of modernity, um, and to understand, therefore, what it takes to create a civilization in the first place. Um, so over the course of my journey, I've made some interesting friends. Um, you all, I understand, do know Milo and do know who he is. Um, one of the other people that I'm now friends with is his friend, Vox Day, whose blog you may be familiar with as well. It's, it's been running even longer than mine. <laughs> um, and he has started a television channel um, where he wants to post programs that are culture building, right? They're, that that he, he, he's been very specific in his description of um, the channel. It's called Unauthorized TV, which is thus the joke about my course that's gonna be on, right? The authorized version of the Bible is the King James Bible, I'm saying. <laughs> We're going back further with the unauthorized version. Um, but Unauthorized TV is meant to be a channel where um, people can find wholesome programming, right? And he's he's been very, very specific about that. It's not for trolling and, and memestering and such, although maybe Owen Benjamin might get up to a bit of that. We don't talk about Owen. Um, <laughs> but that, that it's, it's going to be a, a channel where you can have programs about making homes, making families. His, his friends are doing a show they call Barcelona Life about being a couple, an American couple living in Barcelona. There's another that's a gardening program. Um, there are other programs that are gonna be more political. Um, mine is going to be medieval history, right? And um, I wanted to start our morning off by telling you a little bit about the course because it's, it contains some of the, the, the sort of large scale thinking that I've been doing about what does it mean, in fact, to study the Middle Ages, recover our sense of this deep history, and how do you go about it? Now, I was, I'm thankful that you all were do, willing to do some reading for today, <laughs> so you get to practice a little bit of what I do in my courses at Chicago. Um, what I'm hoping to do with unauthorized, my unauthorized medieval history is translate some of this into this bigger conversation that I know you all are trying to train for, right? How do, how do we get out there and talk calmly and joyfully, but, but, but you know, vigorously about the tradition that we know underpins the very um, culture that, that our our, our opponents in some of these debates, in fact, also enjoy, right? That they're able to attack me as anti-feminist. Well, that only works if you care about women, right? It only works if it, to, to say, you know, you, you're worrying about diversity. If you actually already have an understanding of civilization that includes everyone who's baptized, regardless of race, class, or gender, right? So uh, many of these things I'm trying to figure out with the unauthorized 
course how to translate those in. So I, I thought I'd, I'd introduce you to the course and then you can ask me some questions, some big general questions. Then maybe we have a little break and then we'll start on our, our text, right? Okay, so my, 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 my introduction to um, the course. This is the, I've said I love blogs. Blogspot better be nice to me for, for the foreseeable future because my entire life is set up on these blogs. <laughs> um, but the, it's, it's, it's unauthorized medievalhistory.blogspot.com. Um, and um, I'm putting, right now I have posts that are basically placeholders while I'm getting myself ready to start doing the videos, but there will be videos that go with the, the, um, the lessons, as it were, on the, on the site. Um, just if you're curious, those are my own publications, right? So I'm, I, it, it, it was nice realizing that not only my Mary in the Art of Prayer and From Judgment to Passion, but also the volumes that I've had essays collected into European transformations, medieval empathies, Roman um, religion in the medieval world, from knowledge to beatitude, the Cambridge history of Christianity, history in the comic mode, studies in medieval history, speculum medieval studies are all, and that's my dissertation from Columbia, um, are all witnessing to what it is that we're trying to understand, right? So th that's, th that's the site, that's where to find it. Um, I have um, the pages that you see, you'll get the, the pages are on the top there, right? Um, explain the, the sort of setting for the course, um, that this, the course is going to be the videos, but what's gonna be online here are sort of supporting materials, the background, and I realize as a historian, I can't teach something just by talking, right? I have to get, get you reading, right? So this course is gonna have um, uh, like, posts about each of the videos with selected readings and, and recommended further places to go. And the major goal of the course is to help um, the audience, which it is, it's an audience rather than an, an enrolled online thing, right? There's no grades and you're not doing writing projects, but um, it, it is going to be hopefully a kind of training, not just a kind of entertainment, although I hope to be entertaining as well. Um, and the, the training is going to be in, um, learning how to read sources, right? How to read them in context, how to um, take the kind of training that we do in college about understanding, you know, why is Notka writing, why is Einhard writing when he is, to what audience, why does he take the argument that he does, how do texts create our understanding, and therefore that you, you come to them with a kind of critical eye. Um, this, I think, is obviously important for the, the sorts of debates that we're having in the public sphere because people just go crazy, right? They, 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 they assume, oh, sorry, I, I, sorry, everything I end up doing is talking about Milo because he's all my best examples. But <laughs> he was, we were talking just a minute ago about you know, what, what, what Milo said he wanted on his um, on campus tour on his rider, like, like I need the Skittles sorted and the three Siberian Husky puppies and the, the such. And <laughs> That was a good. That was one of his best, best, li best lists, right? Um, and the people who covered it in the news, taking it seriously, as he really wants three dogs at every venue that he comes to speak at. Are you kidding? You know, the the the, the level of inability to appreciate genre in um, people's engagement with with text is very interesting. Now, when you're reading text from the past appreciating genre becomes quite complicated, right? Because they're always writing for purposes other than the ones that we're reading them. And so to be able to read these texts, you can't go in and say, well, I wanna, re I wanna learn about the history of the kings of Britain. I think I'll read Geoffrey of Monmouth. Anybody know who Geoffrey of Monmouth is? You know, what, maybe why that would be a problem. He, he's, he invents King Arthur, right? And in his own day, William of Newborough, one of the guys that I talk about in my first book, says, Jeffrey made it all up. There's no like hidden source that he found. There may have been, but William's saying, you know, we can't find in any of our ancient stories. Bede never mentions this Arthur person. Gildas doesn't mention him. Jeffrey's making it all up. Well, of course, Jeffrey won because everybody knows about him and King Arthur, and very few people know about William Newborough. Um, but the sort of problem of fake news <laughs> is not new, right? It's, it's the problem of history, and it's the problem of being able to sort sources and, and, and be critical about them and understand that you know, they're framed by particular concerns at the time that they were written, right? So that is, is one of the things that I'm hoping to achieve with my lectures or videos or whatever they are um, in, in, in the online course and that you know, we have a, just a vast array of types of sources from the Middle Ages. I, I list a few in the, the page, chronicles, breviaries, 
chivalric poems, biographies of saints, treatises on government, handbooks on husbandry and housekeeping, manorial records, collection of sermons, miracle stories, beast fables, pilgrimage guides, to name a few, right? That there are, the sources that we have for the Middle Ages are amazingly rich, and yet each of them presents a different kind of problem for interpretation and understanding, and that's what I, I want to use my, my videos to t help people think about. Um, there's also the problem of typicality, right? Which of the things do we use to say this creates the culture? Is it Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, for which we have one manuscript, right? It's an Arthurian story, it's very beautifully told. Tolkien did a translation of it. That, you might say, is representative of the Middle Ages, but in fact, William of Heraldus's Summa de Vitis et Virtutibus, or On the Vices and Virtues, is much more typical of the same period because it survives in hundreds of manuscripts. Right, so which do you study? Well, Gawain is translated even by Tolkien. William Peraldus is still not edited, right? And so we're, we're always having this problem of, if we're looking at the past, are we studying the things that interest us? Or are we studying the things that were typical at the time? Um, uh, I also hope to you know, talk about art, architecture, music. Um, as you can see, I can't, and thank you that you have a screen for me to show <laughs> pictures. I basically can't think without art. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that is very interesting about studying medieval Christianity is how much of it is only carried in the art. I did a, a course this winter um, that you can see the blog site for um, called, um, the, 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 the course was Medieval Christian Mythology, but the, the blog site is um, the um, Speculum Aureum, the Golden Mirror. And one of the great themes of that course was the degree to which Medieval Christianity is about wanting to see God, right? And I spent so much time in the class prep for that course finding images because you start realizing that a good deal of the argument, not just the beauty, which is obviously significant, but a good deal of the argument from the culture is in the art. And if you think about, I, I'd say, if you think about the debased character of much of our current art, I, 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 I mean the stuff that's in the modern art galleries, right? Um, with no divine referent, with no sense of beauty and purpose other than outrage, right? You understand how much we also need to be looking at the images. Um, so that's, that's some of the content that I want to put in the course. Um, if you look at it, the, you know, my course topics and themes for starters are just basically, well, these are some of the things I've thought about. It's obviously expansive, as, as, as far as I can say. The conversion of Europe, um, the development of institutions, including monasteries, cities, universities, governments, and courts. When I say our civilization has developed over centuries, it's, it starts with the development of these institutions, including things like the universities, including things like the towns. Um, the governments, the, the, you know, the monastic contribution to the, the wedding of worship and, and work, all very important. Um, chivalry and feudalism, devotion, spirituality and prayer, education, the arts, animals. I do a whole course on animals and that, ha that has a blog as well if you want to look at that. Um, travel, which is the course that I've just been teaching this quarter. Um, warfare, including the Crusades and so forth, right? It's like, how do you understand a civilization? You have to come at it from lots of different directions, right? Um, uh, so texts, I hope to have interviews with scholars of medieval um, history as well, um, book reviews possibly, and office hours. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I'll have to figure out how to do online like chat, right? <laughs> okay, so, so that's, that's the overview of it. Why are we doing it? And this I'd just like to read to you because I think it's, it's the, so why study the Middle Ages? Once upon a time, this question was easy to answer. The Middle Ages gave birth to Europe. Following the fall of the Roman Empire in the West, the paganism of antiquity bent its knee to the civilizing influence of Christianity. Latin became the language of liturgy and the liberal arts, and every man and woman was recognized as having been created in the image and likeness of God. Cities blossomed as centers of education and self-governance and flourished as hubs of industry and commerce. The learning preserved from antiquity in the monasteries became available in the towns through the preaching of itinerant friars. Feudal warlords were transformed by the ideals of crusade and chivalry from bloodthirsty robber barons into noble knights. While women were lifted up to become mistresses of their own households and wives, but only by their own consent. The Middle Ages were a time filled with light and color and song and joy when bishops held kings to account 
and a beggar might gain audience with the Pope. Castles and cathedrals rose majestically across the land, and every knee bowed in veneration at the sound of the angel's bell in honor of Our Lady and her son. And then came modernity, <laughs> which ruined everything with its lies. Actually, so Paul Crawford, whom I think you all heard from last week, was one, is one of my friends, and he loved that line, right? He said, yes, it's lies, <laughs> right? This course seeks to counter those lies with truth. It's designed as an introduction to the study of the Middle Ages as the formative period in the history of Western civilization. It challenges both the Enlightenment dismissal of this period as dark because it's Christian. I mean, that's why the Enlightenment, just, you know, the enlightened, they're enlightened with reason, right? And they, they don't want all this dark religion stuff. Um, and more recent efforts to minimize the role of Christianity in the self-definition of the West. Its purpose is to expose the myth-making of modernity through close study of the sources on which our knowledge about the Middle Ages is based. Art, architecture, literature, music, philosophy, theology, all reveal a period bursting with love for God and his creation. Whereas to the enlightened philosophes of the 18th century, these were dark ages of superstition and decline. To Christians of the day, they were ages of reason and reform, of faith seeking understanding through the experience of God's love. What darkness there was came from the reality of human sin, the fa falling away from God through failure to cultivate virtue. It took modernity's conviction that there was no such thing as sin to make the Middle Ages truly dark, a darkness which, I say, engulfs the West to this day and grows the further Christians stray from the worship of God and the understanding of the truth. You think I was in trouble with three cheers for white men? My colleagues are never gonna forgive me. <laughs> It all depends on how you tell the story, whether from within the history of Christianity or from without. Um, it should go without saying that the above is not the way most modern scholars, even scholars of faith, tend to tell the history of the West today. Modernity has made us all anxious about celebrating the past, particularly the Christian past, lest we prove ourselves unsophisticated, less worldly than our academic peers. To embrace any orthodoxy other than the one by which all religions are declared as one, whether for good or ill, is to commit the deadly sin of narrowness, refusing to subsume the local into the global, according to which latter doctrine all human beings are the same regardless of how much they might differ in customs and mores. And yet medieval Christians were never so modern as in their conviction that all human beings, whether Christian or not, were capable of reason and therefore of persuasion to the right worship of God. How this conviction gave birth to the self-critique by which the West now judges itself is the central theme of this course. And then I conclude, welcome every man and every woman. <laughs> um, let the quest for light, truth, virtue, beauty, and goodness begin. Um, now, there's a lot packed in there, I appreciate, <laughs> right? And it, but that's basically now my manifesto, saying we ha it used to be that we understood this period as a birth of Europe. Um, modernity has had difficulties with, its, uh, with Europe's, Europe's own self-creation um, and Curiously enough, that ability to critique itself is one of the characteristics of the, of the civilization. Um, and it's very interesting, it's become so hard specifically to talk about it from a Christian perspective, right? And, and I understand that that's one of the things you all are interested in, so I'm hoping we can talk about that. Um, it, 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 it is interesting that I found, it, it, even scholars who are Christian, that I, I'm friends of mine, right, get anxious when I make these sorts of claims. Um, and um, you know the academy is is very very persistent in its its desire to make sure that those of us who are sophisticated and worldly are in fact sophisticated and worldly right that we take a secular position on our understanding whereas what I have done in my scholarship um, both my books right is try to practice empathizing with the perspective of the medieval devotees. Now, I say in my, you know, I make my frames in my book very clear, you are about to step into this understanding that I'm trying to um, uh, imagine through the texts for you. I, I'm here the door is, right? I've described it. It's right there, see it, right? And even when I've done that very, very purposefully, people get upset with me, right? They're saying, I don't want to do that. I don't want, I don't want to pretend to believe in God, right? And I was like, just, just come on, let's just, it's like the fantasy adventure, right? And, and in Mary and the Art of Prayer, I even start with Tolkien, right? And I say, it's like, Tolkien's framing of this is, is how, what is it like to find yourself in the story, like the hobbits find themselves in the story of the Silmarils? And so you step inside, you find yourself in. Now, when you, get, when you finish reading the book, do you want to step back out or not? Hmm. 
door's still there. <laughs> so I, that's, I want to be able to show people that as my understanding of one, how we think about scholarship, but also the stakes of being able to set ourselves in that story. So to do so, I've given, given um, you all some, some hints of where to go. Um, there's a page on great books, which I found sort of funny to do because, you know, the first list of great books is, of course, this set, right? You can guess what that is? I don't know how much you can see this. It's the Bible. I mean, the Bible is, in fact, a list of great books. And here's Ezra, and in, in this is the Codex Amiantinus. It's the oldest complete Bible that we have, interestingly enough, copied in, in Anglo-Saxon England, but, but now down in Rome because it was taken there as a gift. Um, that, that, you know, the original list of great books was the Bible, and there's a, obviously a big debate in antiquity over which books belong on that list or not. Um, more recently, there have been things like the Harvard Classics, um, the Great Books of the Western World, which were done at Chicago, but not with Chicago faculty support, right? Adler was just there as a friend of Hutchins. So the Great Books of the Western World is Chicago, but it's not, long story. Um, and then the, the St. John's College curriculum, you can see these as, as chunks, right? These are, th these are the, the number of books that each of these sets includes for the Middle Ages. How many do you think I have? Well, they start there, <laughs> and they go on for another couple of pages, right? That it, one of the curious things that's happened, even in our, you know, even in lists like the Great Book series, which are meant to be recovering this tradition, they're leaving out most of it, as, as far as I'm concerned, right? They're, and, and obviously, you know, their, their lists go on with more books from the, the, the last 500 years, and they typically have very long lists of books from before the Middle Ages, but they leave out everything in the middle. And I think that's a curious way to try to tell a story, right? That you're only going to tell the beginning with the classics from antiquity and the end with the classics from modernity. Why aren't you going to tell the middle of the story, how we got from one to the other? Um, and therefore how, in fact, modern civilization is not identical with class, the classics. So th that list is up there. You can, you can see that. Um, I also um, have been getting requests over the last few years from people in the in the social media world for reading lists, so I know everybody likes a long reading list. Here you go. <laughs> Here's some more. Um, one of the things to understand is, there, there, I, I say this at the top, there's no right way or wrong way to become interested in history, nor is there one magic route to building a strong base of historical knowledge. You just start in the middle, right? And everybody is always worried about, it's like, should I start with, you know, this textbook, or should I start with, you know, the great books, or sh how should I start? And I'm like, start where you want, right? Because you're already born into the middle. It's not like, <laughs> you're only God got to start at the beginning, right? The rest of us have to come in at the middle and, and, and you know, to a certain extent, what you do in your youth is catch up, right, with the, the, the stories that pre people have been pre, but you're never gonna catch up completely. We can't read all of the books. Guess what? That's been a problem since the Middle Ages. I, actually, and um, what I, I said, I said at the top of, the great books, it's been a problem since Ecclesiastes, right? The making of many books, there is no <laughs> end. So calm down, right? It's you, One, you just start reading now, keep going. There's lots to read, you won't run out. A lifetime of, of, of pleasure, right? Um, but also, th that I say, the only surefire giveaway that you've not read enough history is if you misquote George Santayana about those who do not study history being doomed to repeat it. History doesn't repeat, although, and the phrase says that sometimes it rhymes, although there's a, there's a link in that to say, you know, that attributed to Mark Twain is itself one of those fake facts, right? So <laughs> who said it? Who knows? Um, uh, Scott Adams actually said it much more accurately. Those who do not study history are doomed to repeat the things that appear in history books, but never actually happened, right? So if you, <laughs> if you don't study enough history, you're just going to be repeating all of those all that fake news, like William of Newborough said Jeffrey Monmouth was doing, okay? So you start somewhere, you read a lot, you recognize that it's, it's an iterative process, right? You read, you learn a bit, you go back and you reread, you read some more, um, you, you start where you start, right? And it's all to the good. Um, One of the, it's, and, and you know, I'm saying, and this, this sort of process actually goes back to the Middle Ages because, in fact, people in the Middle Ages were great readers. We don't think of it now, thanks to modernity as a period of great literacy, but in fact was. 
Um, this is um, the Virgin Mary learning to read from her mother, right? St. Anne is, is teaching the Virgin Mary to read. One of the books that I've worked on um, as, a, as a kind of book the most is Books of Hours, because if you could learn, if you could read in the Middle Ages what you read, what you could read, what you started to read from were the Hours of the Virgin, right? It was a prayer book. So the first thing that people tended to want to do, tended to want reading for, was prayer. But obviously then they started writing lots of other stuff down too. So, you know, account books and stories and histories. And we have, you know, we know that people in the Middle Ages um, were, were avid readers. Um, and you should be too, right? So the, the recommended readings begin with, I mean, one is the Cambridge Medieval History, which I have never actually read, but Vox Day has been talking about it as one of his favorite sets, so I figure I have to catch up. See, even I don't <laughs> haven't read everything. Um, what, another good thing is that many of these older um, surveys, including the Cambridge Medieval History, are available online now, so you can kind of get started without having to, to buy the book. Um, I recommend a few textbooks that I think are really good as short um, surveys. Um, some classics, which are, I, I think I'm going to, going to want to do episodes on those because those tend to be the ones that are most colorful in a sense. Things like, um, I'm reading James Walsh's 13th, The Greatest of Centuries right now, which was a bestseller for like 50 years in the United States, the first half of the 20th century. Um, barely read now because he's so celebratory of, of the period. Um, things like Johann Hoitzinger's The Waning of the Middle Ages or Haskins, The Renaissance of the 12th Century. These are the books that created the field and the conversation in the field. So that's why I call them classics, that they're historiographically very important as the books to which the field, the scholarly field responded over the course of the 20th century. Um, I also include links to the syllabi for my courses that I've taught at Chicago. There's a bunch of them. Um, and um, also some links to, in fact, these, go to, these links go to Infogalactic, which is um, Vox's project to make sure Wikipedia doesn't take all of our stories. Um, th these are some of my favorite novels. You can start with novels, right? The two of the ones that I started with as, this, as when I was growing up, the, um, wh where'd they hide? Um, the Door in the Wall and Adam of the Road, which were both Newbery winners, and I read them like in elementary school, and they may be the reason I'm a me medievalist, right? You start with the stories. You start somewhere, right? Um, crusades, because everybody always needs books on the Crusades. And um, then some collections of primary sources, if you've really gotten dug in and you want to start reading um, some of the, 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 cla the patristics and classics. Okay. But of course, we live in a world where there's the digital. And th putting together this list was, was fascinating. I give you a little narrative of how I, I, I grew up into the digital world, right? And it started in, in college when um, Apple f released its first desktops, the Mac 512K, I had one, right? <laughs> Do you know what that is? Um, and um, over the course of, of, of my own career, how, you know, first the card catalogs were put online, so you didn't just have to go to the library to look up the books, um, but you still had to climb up and down the stacks to get to the books. John and I were both spent a lot of time in Butler, um, in, in Butler, right, writing up and down the stacks. Um, uh, but then um, things started being put on CD-ROM so that you could, you know, search databases. Some of our primary source collections were put on CD-ROM in the, in the 90s. Um, and then, um, of course, the, the internet came into public use and suddenly everything started being available simply by, you know, uh, initially it was through subscriptions that university libraries had, right? So for the Patrologia Latina, you had to go to the subscription site for the university, but then, and this this is you know th this is where we are now, right? The iPad, you know, like this magic device, amazing, right? It changed my life, for good or for ill. We'll figure that later. Um, but the same the same time that the iPad came out, Google Books introduced its um, readers, its its uh, its e-reader, right? Which meant not just new books that you could buy like you buy on Kindle, but the scans of all of the printed books ever are in Google Books now, which means that you, this, is, this is a collection that was just in my Google eBooks right now, but it's, it's things like Peraldus. I said The Virtues and Vices has never been published. Well, that's not quite true. It was published in the early modern period in these printed versions, many, many printed versions. There's several of them here, um, which you can now read for free 
as PDFs. You do have to have Latin, <laughs> um, but, but they're all now available through this big scan project, and you can sit there on your iPad. It's like I make the joke, you know, by the, by the time I'm writing my second book, I never left my couch because <laughs> I was able to have access to things that, you know, we have a scan service at the, at the library, but also, you know, major pieces of my research were done through the books that are now available that previously you could only get by, say, going to the Newberry Library or going to the British Library. You could only access the copies of these early printed books by being with the book, and now they're there. Um, so uh, medievalists, interestingly, have been at the forefront of putting a lot of this material together, and so when I go to the conferences now, and there's a, a lecture on, you know, here's some new e-resources we have. I sit with my iPad making links, right? And so I put some of the links here. Um, there's some things that are guides. There are others um, that are text, text collections, um, things like the Internet Medieval Sourcebook, Project Gutenberg. Um, these are just texts online, right? Um, there's an excellent map project that the Harvard um, uh, Graduate students have been working on that Michael McCormick has been in charge of. Digital Atlas of Roman and Medieval Civilizations. If you love maps like I do, you can go in and remap all sorts of things in their, in their um, database. A variety of my favorite databases from Chant to Bestiary to Dante Online and so forth. Um, and then what really changed everything was it, when I was, you know, when I started graduate school, I was I spent some time in Cambridge, England, and got to sit with the manuscripts and work with them there. Um, it's not true that all the manuscripts are digitized yet, but all the pretty ones are. <laughs> and so, if you go to things like um, these, are, some of these are um, catalogs, like the World Digital Library. Um, some are sort of reference sets, so that they're helping you find ones. Uh, the Digital Scriptorium. This set is. Um, lists of digitized manuscripts by different country collections, so the United States, France, Germany, and so forth. And then you get down to the actual libraries, whoops, sorry, the libraries, things like the British Library, the Bodleian, the Bibliothèque Nationale, the Bayerische Staatsbibliothek, all of the, these are manuscripts that are now, you just can, you, not only can you sit with your Google Reader and read all those PDFs of the printed books, you can see the manuscripts, right, at, without ever leaving your couch. I had to buy a new couch once I finished the book because I wore it out, right, sitting on the couch. Um, there's also, you know, obviously I'm able to decorate my page with all these images that are now online. This has transformed my life, right? It's like when, my, when I first started work, to get pictures you had to go and, like, I spent some time at the Courtauld Institute and their photo, photocopy image collection. Right now I can get color versions of them and throw them up on screen in three seconds, right? I just know what to, I, I have to know what to look for, obviously, but there they are. Um, the image, the image um, databases are magnificent, so the British Library, the Met, Courtauld Institute has been doing a big catalog of ivories, um, devotional ivories, stained glass, so forth. There's dictionaries, and then if you're really stuck in by now, um, the Medieval Review is, is reviews of scholarly books, right? So, and, and that's, that's online. Too much? <laughs> <laughs> it's all there, you can all go find it. Um, so do we belong in an ivory tower or do we belong out in the world, right? It, exactly where does this, all of this scholarship live, right? And one, one of the wonderful things that I, I learned putting together th this reference set um, was, well, indeed, I can, I, you know, I can sit on my couch. I mean, it, going to the university, going to the institution, teaching classes, being in that institutional environment is very, very important for training. But we are now in this context in which you can sit on your couch and have access to things that scholars do. It, it, uh, uh, I, I, I start, um, actually, I started off the online page saying, um, once upon a time, only those with access to certain institutions would have been able to read the great works of scholarship. Only those with great wealth would have been able to afford having beautiful images for their devotion. Only those with great staffs of clerks would have been able to manage large accounts of data. Only those with the right social contacts would even have heard of most books. And no, I'm not talking about the printing press, right? It's like, in fact, all of that happened with the advent of the printing press. That no longer did you have to be amazingly wealthy to own a book. No longer did you have to, you know, be in the network of scholars to know that books even existed. No longer did you need, you know, great staffs of clerks to keep account of your records. But it's happened again with the digital revolution, right? And now you all, 
can, without being great, you know, without scholarly credentials, without a great deal of money, hopefully you, you still need personal, like word of mouth, that's why social media is so important, right? Telling each other about the stuff that exists still matters, but we can do it on social media or we can do it, you know, through a lot of different channels. Mm -hmm. Now you have access to these treasures that only, it, at the, you know, in the beginning of my scholarly career, never mind the beginning of my life, only scholars could see. Right, and they're, they're, they're di manuscripts digitized by, for example, the British Library that they wouldn't let me see 10 years ago when I started my project on the Books of Hours because they're such precious objects, they don't want people touching them unless they have a reason to need the object, right? I just want to look at the pictures so <laughs> and read the text, oh well. Now I can do that with the scan, right? And before I, you know, microfilm, it was black and white. Now it's a scan, I can work with it, blow it up, you know, do all these, the, do, you can too, as long as you know where to look, right? I've just shown you. Um, so the, the sort of, is there a place anymore for the ivory tower? Well, funnily enough, ivory tower is um, a word like, um, I don't know, uh, the deplorables <laughs> or Protestants. It was an insult to start with. Um, and what, what the most amusing thing I found um, in, in in writing this one up is it was, it was invented by um, people who considered themselves anti-fascist back in the 20s. <laughs> I thought that was amusing. Um, that it's uh, one of the um, uh, Organization of American Writers, right? And they, they are lambasting people that they say, you know, stay in their ivory towers and don't come out and be, you know, politically active and so forth. Um, the irony for me is, of course, the original ivory tower is not a slur on those of us who want to carry on in scholarship, but her, right? She, the Virgin Mary is the Tower of Ivory, and why that's so delightful to me is she is the, the, the source of all of this knowledge that I'm talking about with you today. That Mary, um, as medieval Christians understood her, was the one who gave birth to wisdom, right? She's the mother of the word. She's the mother of knowledge, and as medieval scholastics understood her, she knew everything. And there's, there's this lovely list in, my, in one of the books I worked with for my Mary in the Art of Prayer, how she had knowledge of all the mechanical arts, um, including those particularly associated with women, embroidery, silk working, and weaving, but she was also skilled in the liberal arts, the trivium, um, the arts of grammar, rhetoric, and logic. She was skilled in the quadrivium, the arts of mathematics, um, which is arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. She was well versed in civil and canon law, in physics and medicine. Um, she knew the nature of things, animal, vegetable, mineral. She likewise had knowledge of all the matter of the sentences, the, the textbook of theology. Um, above all, she had knowledge of scripture because as they understood it, the scriptures spoke about her all the time and not just the New Testament, right? The Old Testament is filled with references to Mary. So to describe her, they basically had to write encyclopedias and that is, one of the curious sort of intellectual frames of the great explosion of learning that happens in the 13th century in the universities is that they're framing it with this desire to describe the creator through his mother, right? And this is the, this is a 16th century drawing of it, but that's the seal of the University of Paris for the Faculty of Arts from, from the Middle Ages, and Mary is at the center of it, right? You do want the ivory tower in academia, but you want her. Um, and so having disseminated all this knowledge out into the wild and said, please come study, um, I say, well, if you want to come join us in medieval studies, there are a number of these organizations that have considered themselves professional organizations but are committed to the study of the Middle Ages generally and are in fact open to anybody who wants to attend, right? So the Medieval Academy of America, um, is open to all persons concerned with the study and teaching the Middle Ages, including but not limited to independent scholars and so forth, right? So you're welcome to come. Um, likewise, Kalamazoo, our medieval congress at Western Michigan, um, or there's one that I haven't ever actually attended because it's, it's poorly timed for my fencing schedule, actually, <laughs> but also because it's, it's in the middle of the summer and I need to be writing. Um, there's a Congress at Leeds, which is, is, is rivaling Kalamazoo in, in size, right? That they get thousands of, of uh, attendees as well. So we're, we're in an exciting moment of possibility for 
re you know, recovering the study of this period and also being able to make contact with people who are, are interested in, in talking about it. So I welcome you to the world. <laughs> and um, you have any questions about the big picture version of things? Sure. Yeah, I was just curious uh, to what extent you think the internet will become a sort of parallel institution for serious scholars and with your personal experience being attacked by the left, what, what's your, how can we gauge your pessimism and your optimism and where, and where they lie? Because you seem very excited about the dissemination of information through the internet. I'm here now. It's an opportunity, right? Nothing, nothing bad has happened to me, right? And and that's what's that's what's interesting about the way the left operates and this like it's shame. You're a Nazi, and it's like once they've said it eighteen thousand times, you stop hearing it, right? It's like you recognize that it, it was it's nothing but a scare tactic, right? It's now if they do start throwing things, I actually am. It's like the milkshake stuff is 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 actually worrying me. And that you say that's they they are now recognizing that the only way they can silence us, it's to threaten us in, the, in our physical life, right? But the, the online stuff um, is, it's, it's, it's meant to, you know, if you get a mob of people calling you names, you just say, I don't like being called names and I'll go away now, right? And, and so far three years in, I've been called every name they can come up with, including in BuzzFeed and the New, York, the New York Times did an article too. With the, the, uh, Vox was actually once the, we were like labeled together in the New York Times. He's like, "You want to do a course, right?" So <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was that day. I sent him the ar I sent him the New York Times article, and I said, "Look, Vox, we're in, we're there together." And he says, Do "Hey, Dr. Brown, you want to do a course?" <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, fine, right? You 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 recognize these things as opportunities because there's clear and there's clearly interest out there. I've gotten." really good response. Vox has done a, a couple of dark streams asking people whether they're interested in a course like this and you just get streams of people saying, yes, we want history. So I say it's it's as as it was, w okay, so I started college in 1982 and um, one the, the first lecture we had for early modern Europe, um, Jean, um, uh, sorry, Gail Stokes, um, w w stood up and said, you know, this form of teaching has been outdated for 500 years, thanks to the printing press, right? Because medieval, the medieval university, the, um, they were called lectures at the university because they literally would read, right? They were lec reading, lec lexio was reading, right? And they would read and then comment on texts, right? Because books were expensive and the students didn't necessarily have their own copies, so your, your, your method of lecturing was read it out, comment, read it out, comment, right, like that. 500 years, you know, we got, we've had the printing press since then, printing press, yeah, printing press. Um, that's uh, the Planting Moretus house in Antwerp, it's one of the early printing houses. Why do we still have university, right? It's like with with the the, the digital, and particularly with videos, right? We're suddenly we can we can do something else, but we don't know how it's going to change things. Because my sense is it will probably, if if we do it well, which we can, become the thing that just makes it more possible, right? It will be. Um, I have too many hobbies. I I, I also. I'm a very bad fiddle player, right? I, for as long as I've been playing now, I should be better at it than I am. But I, I take classes at, at, at um, the school in, in Chicago. There's videos of people playing fiddle tunes online, right? But does that mean nobody wants to go to class? No, it means lots of people can watch the videos online, and then some people are inspired to want to come to class with a teacher in real, you know. So I think it just expands your sense of you can do it here, and then you might intensify and go here and it's it's all to the good. I don't think it wipes out, I mean people are always worrying about it like well if everybody's learning online nobody will want to go to university and it's like well maybe people want to come to university because they'll want more intense study of the thing that they learned about you know to a certain extent online. It's, it's like worrying, it's like saying the printing press destroyed education. No it didn't. It, it did change the way, it, it changed its value but it, it, it didn't, I mean it changed, it changed what specific activities were valuable, but it didn't wipe it out, it, it, it expanded. Yeah. The milkshaking though, I, that's I'm worried about. I don't know what we're gonna do about that. Wear, wear, wear you know, rain gear, but it, 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 if they start throwing stuff that's actually, you know, worse than milkshakes, that's, that's a big problem. Names, no, don't worry about those. Yes, this is just a technical question about the uh, online source books. It's just mm -hmm. so you have links on the websites, you can install these different databases and things like the Bridge Library. 
how open actually are these things to these online sources to the general public? Because a lot of times, you know, uh, when I've been doing with LinkedIn writing stuff, just sometimes from the work history, most of others just from online history, you kind of have to be, you know, in the actual library to have access to the database. Or these are all, no, these are all open. Oh, really? Right, no, no, the, I only put links to things that are completely open, okay. open access. Yeah, no, I, I would not do that to you. I would not do that to you. And, and the thing is, I did go, we have, like at Chicago, we have study guides for our library, and there's certain kinds of online sources that are still only available through the libraries. Right, no, all of these are open. All of these are completely open. Yeah, <laughs> go fun. <laughs> go have fun. <laughs> They're all totally open. Yeah. One of the things that Dr. Cropper mentioned The reason why we have such problems today is because there were splits in the kind of end of the medieval era in which people stopped doing things that they believed rationally and sort of basing it on experience. I'm getting the term in the movie. Nominalism. Nominalism. Do you comment on that? And, I mean, do you agree with that? Do you think that's a good interpretation of how we've gotten to where we are today? Um, I think it's part of it. I, 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 and and I, I know what he's talking about. I haven't it's properly worked through that, but it came up, for example, it comes up in odd little ways, right? So I did a course last autumn on virtues and vices, which is obviously one of the things I'm interested in. It's like the training in virtue and how do you think about what virtues are and, and how, you know, are they gifts of the Holy Spirit? Are they habits? Are they, you know, aspects of your personality? Where do they come from? And we were reading through, because this is what I do in all my classes, reading through primary sources, right? And we start with Psychomachia uh, and the battle of the virtues and vices. We work through um, Gregory's Morality and Job, we worked through things like um, uh, Peter Abelard on ethics, William of Auvergne, who's a scholastic, and his big summa on virtues and vices. And there was, a, there was a, a sort of commonality in the way in which these authors from antiquity through the 13th or 14th century talked about the problem of virtue, right? And then the book that I had assigned um, last was by Dionysius the Carthusian, who is a 15th century author. And I thought it was just gonna be a compilation of the previous tradition, right? Because that's what Dionysius did. He, he's Carthusian, they, Carthusians don't go out, right? They, they have a cell and a garden, and he sat and wrote books. <laughs> um, and what he did was make compilation books of the long tradition going before him, right? And so I thought that was it, and I'm, I'm sitting there reading it um, for class, and one of my students wrote to me, it's a mature student saying, you do realize that this is just filled with nominalism. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And then I started realizing it's like something changed, right? There was a, there was a radical change in the feel of what it meant to be virtuous and ethical. And, and the, the primary thing that showed up in that context was it was much more punitive and it was, it was um, much more, um, I mean, I was curious about it because Dionysius is writing in the in the urban context, and so there was a lot of concern about sins associated with living in a, a city together, like gossip and slander, and, and, and so those all felt really topical. Um, but there, w but there was also a a, a different character to um, the sense of how possible it was to become virtuous and what it was like having virtue. And but the nominalist end up that's where Luther ends up, right? The nominalist end up being um, in, in that in that context, very concerned with this this kind of itemization of of virtue, and you see that 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 does then change the character of the culture, whereas previously it was it was um, virtues were the ornaments of the soul, right? They're jewels of the soul, and they they they, they you acquire them through grace, and most of the meditations are like that. W something happens in the in the late 14th, early 15th century where the, the the sort of sense of morality changes, and what Paul tends to focus on is is the theological implications of it. It does change things, but it would be curiously in subtle ways like that, so that something big is transformed, but you're not really sure why, because oftentimes they're still using the older material to talk about it. So, what would the older um, In my version of things, it's much more joyful, right? It's it's it. Th these are um, this is a, a famous um, beginning to a, a moralized Bible from the 13th century, and this sense of God as creator and the the, the things the 
13th the greatest of centuries. I knew it would, I knew it would be useful to carry it around. Uh, this is a 1952 printing of a 1907 book, right? Um, his, Walsh's point in the, the 13th the greatest of centuries is this is the, this is the, the um, century during which the universities came into being, the cathedrals were built, all of this great literature was written, women have this very high, high status, um, and it's, it's a very um, positive view of creation and existence. It, nominalism changes that sense of our relationship to the cre 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 creation, and that is another of the things that I know Paul and I have talked about that he's concerned about, the way it changes the history of science, the way it the way it affects our, our our sense of I mean what you end up the long version the long reign train of what happens because of nominalism is the God in the gaps argument so that you end up with atheistic arguments saying well as long as you know if you can explain all this stuff materially you no longer need God and that's a that's one of the offshoots of that that shift in, in language but it, it takes a long time to get to that place to get to that end point whereas initially they're they're solving problems that don't feel that nefarious to start with. Like Dionysius is just making catalogs of virtues and vices and talking about what it's like to live in a town. But something something shifted in the way in which he considered it possible for a soul to be virtuous. And similar sorts of effects, I think, in science. I need to study that more. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. You had your hand up. Yeah, I was wondering, so the, you've had attacks kind on you in just in the manner of you know, slander and that stuff. Have you ever found that, has there been more sophisticated, like actual kind of scholar opposition to your view of things and ways of maybe they read the primary sources differently or, or anything like that, or is it all much more? Are you kidding? Okay. <laughs> I would like to think, you know. Yeah, no. Uh, there's at least, if, if that's their stance, that there's some attempt. Like, I, I don't, I'm not very well versed in medieval history, but in much, much more modern history. And yeah. Like the example of like the, the Goldhagen um, Browning debate and, and this wrote parallel books using the same main primary source and two very different confusions right. or conclusions. And if there was kind of anything similar to that, and you know, we're going to, we as channeling leftist ideology or something right here, it's like, well, we'll look at these primary sources and then, you know, try to read it in a way that fits our box and at least kind of attempt in, in that, or is it solely just been name calling and? Um, it's been name calling. Um, part of the problem is, of course, in my books, I'm challenging them directly um, in, in, in the sense that um, with my, go back to my, um, not so much from judgment to passion, which is more trying to read biblical commentary as actual literature, and I and I'm more modest in that and saying, I'm trying to show you where this uh, culture of empathy comes from. The the passion part is the the um, compassion for Mary at the suffering of Christ. Um, in Mary in the Art of Prayer, though, that's when I'm, I was playing with my idea. Of there's this door, and you can walk through it. That I I I purposefully in that book said, I'm trying an experiment here that is about, I mean, not just empathizing in the way that, and, and I was actually a little surprised that people responded to this book so much. This book won prizes, right? Um, this book has had a wonderful review by Father Jim Shaw, James Shaw that he literally wrote on his deathbed, right? And, and said it was one of the best books he'd ever read, which I, <laughs> right? But he liked it because he read it as a book of prayer, right, and, and also of, of scholarship. The, the, um, the, the responses that I have between these two books, my, my overtly saying not only are the feminists wrong in the way in which they caricature Mary as, you know, this bad thing for women, um, but, you know, the biblical scholars are wrong because they've, since the Reformation, decided Mary doesn't belong because she's not really in scripture. Um, the, um, the sort of narrative of, the history of Christianity is is wrong if it needs to always see Mary as coming in as this kind of accident or accretion rather than as central to Christianity. Well, and okay, and I also say imagine yourself saying these prayers, right? Um, that is enough of a challenge for them. They don't even have to get to me for my politics by the time I've, I've, I've set it up in a scholarly way that is just, it's, it's, it's challenging not only our narrative but also our methodology. As, as academics, and I, 
I was surprised initial, you know, sort of pr pr presentations I made of it, you know, now some of them almost a decade ago, um, that people didn't see it as a as as more of a um, you know this imaginative exercise that they'd like to to try. They found it threatening rather than appealing, and that did surprise me because I love you know trying on stuff and you know. I'd say, well, I'm in a sport where you wear a mask, right? <laughs> uh, but that people are very anxious about stepping out of their own perception. And that, to, that to me, if you want the, the sort of what's happening with the leftist stuff, they see me, I'm, I'm challenging the perception by which they have constructed their understanding and saying, I don't, you know, I, that's, I disagree, right? And if you don't have practice, as I've been practicing for decades now, stepping out of your own frame and trying on others, all that feels like is terror, right? You just, you just feel terrified. And so what I see in, the, in my colleagues' reaction, they're saying, what she says is completely nonsensical. And I'm like, I can show you with the, the scholarly steps to get there. You're balking because you don't want to try it out, right? You, yeah. you, you, you don't want to try it out. And that I, appre I do appreciate it as a, as a psychological response, but um, I, I yeah, it's 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 not easy. I, I would find I you know I would find other perspectives very difficult to try on, and I acknowledge that. Right? I don't want I don't want to be practicing that, but I do you know acknowledge that I I I would probably need to try. But I would still say, as a good Augustinian, having done so, I'm still going to try to draw you into my understanding because that's the way conversion works.